Did you look at that? Nearly four months without a single FNAF episode. Feels like it's a brand new day for the channel. There have been so many new games, new meta theories, even some classic science episodes thrown in. <sighs> I'm happy, I'm healthy. Life is good. And now, time to relax. Hello Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, the show where old habits and old animatronics die hard. Today we're talking about the 12th and final installment of the Fazbear Frights book series, Felix the Shark. That's right friends, the final book. <laughs> Until the next three come out later this year. <laughs> Let's not think about that and instead focus on Felix. Now, this final book is special. Just like all the others, it too is a collection of three short, spooky stories vaguely connected to the wider FNAF lore. But where this one is different is that it's meant to be a collection of cut stories. As the official description reads, quote, stories that didn't make the cut for the first 11 books. Which, okay, they didn't appear in numbers 1 through 11, but still, they wound up getting published anyway as the 12th one. Is that such a big deal? In fact, because they're last, they're probably in the most important position of any of the stories, and while well, you might assume that they were cut because they were weaker or lesser than the 33 other Fazbear Frights that were produced, it's not really true. You cut the story about an animatronic shark, but you kept the one where a boy turns into a traffic sign? You cut Girl Solves Dead Body Shoved Into Animatronic Suit Mystery, but kept Tiny Guppy Bodies? You cut a security guard named Mike going around collecting haunted FNAF memorabilia, and yet kept Fazgoo. The truth is, we don't really know why these were cut. It could have been a quality thing, it could have been the that they confused the lore, or maybe, just maybe, it could have been that they were intentionally designed to set up secret puzzles that we were meant to solve, and those puzzles never got fully realized. Spoiler alert, I think it might have been that last one. I believe that Scott was planning to use this final book as a launching point, the start of a real-world treasure hunt that would have required using the books, the games, even stuff like the coloring book in order to crack. I suspect that this was a riddle so far-reaching and so complex, it would have required the cooperation of FNAF theorists from across the globe. Today, I'm gonna explain the clues that led me to this conclusion, but more importantly, I'm gonna ask you for your help. You see, while I'm reasonably confident this thing was never finished, I'm not sure. I can't be sure unless you all double check for me. A few years ago, I asked for all your help in solving the security logbook, and a day later, we discovered the name of Cassidy. Today, I'm gonna ask you for something similar. I'm gonna take you on a journey through some weird corners of FNAF lore and some loose threads that I see in this new book, and then I'm gonna ask you for the favor. I need you to help me either solve this thing once and for all, or debunk it. And who knows, maybe this is the push that we need to get the next major answer to the game's lore. But before you help me with the lore, I was wondering if you'd help me in another way. It's time for our newest collection of Theorywear merch. And as always, you checking out the items goes a long way to help fund everything that we're doing over here on the channel. This collection in particular is going to be especially fun if you're a fan of analog horror, The X-Files, or Area 51, because it's all about conspiracy boards, skywalk, Watching and secret undercover fact-finding missions. Let me just start off by introducing you to the item that everyone's gonna want to get, the Game Theory Lava Lamp. Filled with neon green alien goo, this one is perfect for your room or your desk and has been running non-stop in my office since I got the finalized prototype a month ago. It is awesome. It's also a completely unique piece of YouTuber merch. If you ever wanted a lava lamp while also showing off your theorist pride, this is the perfect item for you. The lava lamp also partners really well with another brand new item in our roster, the T-Man sunglasses. These things are perfectly balanced, as all things should be. A classic design that perfectly frames your face with a hit of fun game theory green on the insides of the arms, while also keeping a muted matte finish and subtle patterning on the outside of the arms to give them an air of sophistication. Historically, I've struggled finding sunglasses that I love, so I decided to make some sunglasses that I absolutely love, and that I think you're gonna love too. Speaking of things I love, this new jogger set. I mean, just look at the picture on screen right now. I don't know if I've ever felt that good in a picture in my life. And if it can make me feel that good posing in an awkward photo shoot, imagine how great you'll feel in it lounging around or out and about. Soft and lightweight, but still warm and stylish. And of course, complete with thumb holes. Also, it wouldn't be a new Theorywear merch drop without a slew of new hoodies, t-shirts, and jackets. All of it with embroidered details to give you quality that you can feel. This isn't just your typical YouTuber spray-on design merch. These items are all custom cut and sewn to deliver you actual high-quality garments. Garments that you'll actually want to wear and that will last for as many times as you want to wear them. Just look at the liner of this jacket. It is literally a redacted document, which is a detail that I specifically requested the team execute on. I mean, where else do you find clothing 
something that has cool details like that. In my opinion, it just elevates the design, and I think that you'll appreciate it too. Last item that I'll specifically call out here, our first ever button-down shirt. Ripped straight out of Roswell, New Mexico, the alien print here is super fun. Again, we custom designed this fabric from the ground up to make the shirt. It's also perfectly accessorized with a tinfoil hat. So grab yourself a garment that goes perfectly with some red yarn and your conspiracy theory boards. A handful of items are available right below this video in the merch shelf, or you can just head on over to theorywear.com to check out the full collection. And as always, thank you guys so much for the support. Now back to FNAF. In order to unwrap the secret FNAF ARG, let's start by breaking down the stories in Felix the Shark, shall we? The final story, You're the Band, is probably the most obviously related to existing FNAF lore. In it, a small boy named Timmy becomes obsessed with everyone's favorite pizza murder franchise, Freddy Fazbear's. His mother finds him a strange Freddy mask on the internet and gives it to him for his birthday. After putting it on, Timmy starts to change. He doesn't like the things he used to, he becomes moody and aggressive, he even yells about protecting the others when Granddad walks towards him with a knife. Eventually, Timmy is led to an abandoned Freddy Fazbear's building by a shadowy figure. The whole thing gives off some very solid midnight motorist vibes. In order to rescue him, his mother teams up with a former Freddy's security guard named Mike. Hmm. Turns out the Freddy mask was possessed by one of the children from the original Fazbear murders. When Timmy put on the mask, the spirit transferred into his body, which allowed it to control him. When Mike and Timmy's mom arrive at the restaurant, Timmy is on stage in Freddy's position, performing alongside Bonnie and Chica. After getting attacked by the puppet, Mike manages to get the Freddy mask back onto Timmy, which captures the spirit. He then puts the mask back onto the original Freddy head, getting the spirit back to where it belongs. Now, I gotta admit, I got really excited when I read the story. We've suspected for a while that FNAF 1 security guard Mike Schmidt was really Michael Afton going from location to location to undo the evils of his father, William. That's why we play as Mike through pretty much every installment of the series up through Ultimate Custom Night. It's why Mike's name appears in Sister Location, why Fazbear Frights burns down in FNAF 3, and why the security guard in FNAF 2 is fired for tampering with animatronics and odor, just like Mike was in FNAF 1. Up until now, that theory's never been confirmed, but this story seems to be strong evidence for exactly that idea. A security guard named Mike going around collecting the old artifacts from Freddy Location in order to help free the spirits of those trapped within. So that was already pretty cool and totally made reading this book worthwhile. Anytime we can get more evidence to support a theory within the franchise, absolutely worth it. But while You're the Band was explicitly lore heavy, the other two stories were equally fascinating, but for different reasons. There were details that felt odd or out of place and comments from characters that seemed oddly specific in a way that just triggered my lore hunting senses. In the title story, Felix the Shark, we follow a young man named Dirk who's reminiscing with his friends about their shared experiences with Freddy Fazbear's. However, Dirk's memory is slightly different to everyone else's. He's convinced that there was an extra animatronic, a shark named Felix. When his friends make fun of him, Dirk sets off on a cross-country quest to prove that he's not crazy. It takes him six restaurants, but Dirk eventually does learn the truth. It turns out Felix was made by the owner of one very specific Freddy Fazbear's after his son tragically drowned. Why would that lead him to a shark animatronic? Because it was a shark that actually pushed the body back to shore. Couldn't make this stuff up if I tried. Eventually, Dirk does manage to locate Felix. The whole FNAF pizzeria is hidden inside an abandoned water park. But the weird part isn't the where, but rather the how of finding Felix. You see, Dirk is only able to find the pizzeria using a series of clues that are found in a random novel written by the creator's daughter. In universe, Felix's creator also had a daughter who grew up to become a popular author. And in one of her books, The Dogged Dogmatist, she hides a series of clues in plain sight within the book's dialogue. These clues ultimately prove meaningless to the characters in the book because they weren't meant for the characters. They were instead meant for the readers to give them information they needed to find Felix. It is very weird. Anyway, Dirk figures all of this out and confronts the author. She gives him her butterfly necklace and he uses all of this Indiana Jones style to unlock a secret key hidden in the bottom of an empty pool at the water park. The key unlocks the path to the secret Freddy's where Dirk finally finds Felix. And then Dirk dies by climbing into the tank with Felix because these characters always have to die in the stories. It's dumb, but, you know, so be it. Anyway, you see what's so weird about all this, right? Out of nowhere, this story is talking about clues to a real-world location hidden inside of another book. Clues that are meaningless to the characters, but meaningful to the readers. Not only did this stand out to me as a suspiciously meta moment, but it also got me to immediately think about the previous Fazbear Frights installment, Prankster. You see, in preparation for the release of Felix the Shark, I wanted to refresh myself on all the previous stories. There are 33 of these things, after all. It's a lot to keep track of. So, I turned to a another book, the recently released Ultimate Guidebook, which, if you don't know, has summaries of literally everything that's ever happened in the Freddy Fazbear universe, from the games to the books to the fan theories. Basically, if you're
trying to catch up with the series quickly, it's definitely worth a read. And since this is the third and final edition to the book, one written by Scott Cawthon, you know that whatever is deemed most relevant for the lore is going to be called out within its pages. Anyway, each Fazbear Fright story has its own little summary page providing a general plot overview as well as a list of connections between the story and the games. Not everything here is useful, but it definitely gets you into the mindset of the authors, and it helps you see some of the connections that the stories were trying to make. Again, if it doesn't make the cut to appear in this book, you're likely barking down the wrong path. Likewise, if something is called out within these pages, it's at least worth considering when theory crafting. TLDR! As I was getting close to the end of my refresher course, I noticed this in the new lead section for the title story of Book 11, Prankster. Quote, Some of the puzzle clues, such as Stinger, Moot, and even more frights, have implications beyond the plot. Careful readers may want to give these scenes a second look. Implications beyond the plot, you say? Just like with Felix the Shark, it appears that the ultimate guide is also pointing us to meta clues within a different book. Clues that are meant for us, the readers, rather than for the characters in the story. So, I went back to Prankster. In this story, the main character Jeremiah is trying to save his friends from a mysterious glitchy voice that's freed itself from a FNAF VR game that's being worked on at the company. Sounds pretty darn familiar. Along the way, he's presented with a series of riddles. Stinger Moot, which is an anagram of testing room. Give me one and I'll make more. Each one like the one before. What am I? Your next clue contains even more frights. To get there, you just need to follow the lights. I see you're moving closer to your goal. Follow the lights to make things right. And for the key to find where your friends hide, roll up your sleeves and reach inside. Now, I've gone back and forth over these clues multiple times, but it felt like a lot of them were just pointing back to stuff that we'd already discussed in previous theories. The give me one and I'll make more felt like a reference to the glitch trap cult, using FNAF VR's tapes to infect more playtesters. The following the lights clues maybe could be a reference to Princess Quest, where we have to light the lanterns to reveal the truth and eventually set Vanessa free, but none of this was new information. We've talked about all of this stuff in depth. Security Breach seemed to confirm some of this stuff, and to be honest, the connections I could make were speculative at best. I tried rearranging the letters and the anagrams, didn't really get anything interesting. I even considered that maybe the Stinger Moot and even more Frights clues were literal. The Stingers of the Fazbear Frights books were the epilogues about the Stitch Raids, so maybe if the Stinger is Moot, then the Stitch Raid stuff is ultimately meaningless. Even more Frights might refer to the next set of books, Tales of the Pizza Plex. I mean, sure, that's a valid explanation, but it was speculation at best, and also pretty darn lame. Why would you go to all the trouble of hiding meta clues like this about stuff that feels ultimately underwhelming? These aren't really questions that people were asking themselves, you know? So, at least according to the Ultimate Guide, there's definitely something hidden inside of that prankster story, and I'm not exactly sure what it is, but there was even more that was suspicious with Felix the Shark. You see, Dirk doesn't just find the secret Freddy's thanks to written clues inside of a random book, there's also a very specific drawing in the middle of that book. Here's the full quote when describing the dogged dogmatist, the book where the hidden clues are from. Quote, The man's search for the creature was convoluted on the whole, but certain lines in the book went beyond convoluted. They just didn't make sense. Neither did the drawing in the middle of the book, an ornate and frilly sketch of what looked like butterflies and flowers. The drawing was never referred to in the book, and it couldn't be related to any of the story. Were the odd lines and drawings some kind of code? For what purpose? And that's not the only time drawings are brought up in this one story. There was yet another odd reference in Felix the Shark that jumped out to me. Quote again, I'd forgotten all about Freddy's, but yeah, now I remember. I loved the Freddy's coloring books. That's what started my drawing. Eventually, I got tired of coloring and just drew the figures. Last year, the official FNAF coloring book released, which for a normal franchise would be a big old who cares moment. But here, where the biggest character reveals happened in a spin-off children's activity book, yeah, I wouldn't put anything past this franchise. So it felt strange to mention a real world item for it only to mean nothing. So, of course, I bought myself the coloring book and the official how to draw book. I went through the pages over and over and over again, but the only thing I was drawing was a blank. Seriously though, I couldn't find anything. Loads of cool pieces of artwork, like this twisted chica that's only ever mentioned by name, but nothing major. I checked with black lights, I heated up a page or two to see if it would reveal some invisible ink. Nothing. Or at least nothing that I could find. And then it hit me. What if this wasn't about solving a mystery within the story, but instead something bigger? Something more real? The clues in Dirk's book didn't make any sense until you were in the right place at the right time. This could all be hinting at an ARG, where just like Dirk, if you find the location, suddenly the clues that people had been theorizing about for months start to fall into place. Which leads us to the final story of Felix the Shark, The Scoop. In this story, a young girl named Mandy is an online FNAF theorist. No joke, she even signs off one of her posts by saying, and I quote, I can't share all my secret facts yet until I solve this game theory. Anyway, Mandy digs through the code of FNAF 
FNAF 3. Literally FNAF 3 the game. It is mentioned explicitly, only to discover a hidden picture of a building. She tracks it down and she learns about a real life missing children's incident. After a few nightmares where the spirit of the dead child appears, she ends up going to the location only to find an old animatronic bear given off a nasty smell. Surprise, surprise, the kid was inside of there the whole time. Mandy is praised as a hero for finally finding the missing child, and she closes out her blog by saying, quote, I will probably never know for certain how this mysterious building is connected to the FNAF universe. The only thing I am certain of is if the creator wanted us to know, I think he would tell us. <laughs> wow. Just wow. Feeling a bit attacked, not gonna lie, though, in my defense, if we waited for Scott to tell us anything, we'd know next to nothing about this franchise's lore. Just saying. Anyway, outside of the heavy references in this story to theorists and the real world game of FNAF 3, the weirdest thing about this one is that it contains a lot of specific details as to where the events of the story take place. 33 Fazbear Frights in, and no other story in the franchise features this level of detail. The cities, the street names, file names, locations of buildings, details that are seemingly inconsequential to the greater story, and in pretty much every other book would be skimmed over or kept vague. When Mandy finds this mysterious image in the game files, she traces it back to Utah. Yes, the actual US state. This fact is further solidified when Mandy's mom takes her on a business trip to Cedar City, a real city in Utah to complete the investigation. Now this is where the trail starts to go cold, because what Mandy's looking for is an old cinema on Willowfield Road in Peace Valley, which after a lot of Google searches I can tell you just doesn't exist, at least not in Utah. However, in the story we do learn that Peace Valley is only 15 minutes on highway from Cedar City, so I looked up where you can drive to in 15 minutes from the center of Cedar City, and it turns out there is a very small town just to the south called Canaraville. So I hopped onto Google Street View to check out other details that the book mentioned, like the old cinema, which used to be a pizzeria, as well as having a post office on the corner. Unfortunately, neither of these things seem to exist in Canaraville. They do have a post office, and it's near a corner, but it's more like the middle of the street. And so shy of me buying a plane ticket to go to the middle of nowhere Utah myself, my options were once again drying up. So okay, but what about the actual game? The game Mandy is playing is specifically called out to be FNAF 3. I wondered if Scott had maybe retroactively put a file into the game that maybe everyone's missed, so I went over to Steam and looked at the update logs, but the game hasn't been updated since April of 2015, and I very much doubt that Scott's been playing a seven year long con, especially since Into the Pit, the first Fazbear Frights book didn't hit store shelves until December of 2019. But Mandy wasn't just playing FNAF 3, it's explicitly mentioned that she's playing the FNAF 3 mobile port. So I took a look at those update logs, same situation, the game hasn't been updated since February of 2020. Now, we don't know when this story got cut in the two years of Fazbear Frights run, so it could have been in existence then, but I'll be honest, I do not have the elite hacker skills to bust open a mobile game to look for the files. And so, just like that, I was out of options, out of clues, out of ideas. Gotta be honest, I feel kinda defeated on this one. Weeks of looking through these books trying to find something that just wasn't clicking, and yet I couldn't shake it. The whole thing gave me some big Gravity Falls ARG vibes. For those of you who don't know, one of my favorite TV shows of all time, Gravity Falls did this massive globe-spanning ARG back in 2016. It was a series that was all about hidden mysteries, ciphers, secret codes, complete with a book, much like the survival logbook that you could buy that contained puzzles and secrets for the fan community to solve. And this ARG, launched after the conclusion of the show, tasked fans of the series from all corners of the map to work together in a quest that would eventually lead them to a statue of the show's villain, Bill Cipher, hidden out in the middle of the woods. Maybe FNAF was seeding out clues for something similar. Or maybe there were plans to do a similar sort of treasure hunt, but the plans got scrapped along the way. I can't be sure, but there were just too many weird details here that didn't seem to be mere coincidences. Regardless, I'd been bested, but that didn't mean I was done. The last time I felt like this was when the survival logbook released, but instead of giving up, I threw the clues that I'd noticed out to you guys, the theorist community to help me solve it, and he came through. We found Cassidy's name, a name that has since been confirmed by Scott himself. So here I am again at the end of my tether, asking asking you for help once more. It seems like something's here, but if it is, I can't figure it out on my own. Maybe you're a theorist from Utah and you know the locations I'm talking about. Maybe you do know how to break open the files of a mobile game. Maybe you're as obsessed with this franchise as I am and you too have the coloring book and you notice something on those pages that I don't. We haven't let FNAF beat us yet and we're sure as heck not gonna let it happen today. If you think you've gotten yourself some answers or maybe just another lead, head on over to the Game Theorist subreddit to post your findings. I'm gonna be keeping a very close eye on this one, because like you, I want to see this franchise solved. Link is down in the description below to check out the Game Theory subreddit. And speaking of what's below the video, one final reminder about the new Theoryware, which is available now. It's one of the biggest
biggest launches that we've done in terms of sheer number of items available, and I'm super excited to finally be showing it to you. Also, I'm just gonna say it, if you do want the lava lamp, which I think is gonna be our hottest seller, both literally and figuratively, buy that one today or tomorrow. I'm pretty sure that one will probably sell out in a day or two. And some of these others, like the emergency broadcast tee and the data hunter sweatshirt, if I were to guess, are gonna be close behind. So if you have a theory yourself and you wanna show off your theorist pride while helping to support everything we do here on the channel, grab some of this new collection before it gets redacted from the record and hidden in an underground vault. Merch shelf with selected items is right below the video, and the full roster is available right now on theorywear.com. Thank you again for your support with the merch, thank you again for helping me to solve this FNAF ARG, and thank you as always for watching. Remember, it's all just a theory. A GAME THEORY! I'll see you next week.